Wonderful. Thank you. Well, folks, it is such a pleasure being with you as Jeanette has graciously introduced me. My name is CJ Calvert, TEDx speaker and author of Bouncing Back. I represent Inkblot, and today we are talking about creating a positive mental attitude. Over the course of our time together today, we're going to be taking a look at understanding what it means to have a positive attitude, the difference between being realistic and positive, how we can reframe to see situations differently and re-script our own internal dialogue so that we can bounce back and enjoy each day. Now, folks, with any webinar, it can be very, very easy to get distracted. People wandering in and out of the room. We might be glancing at our cell phone, responding to a text or an email. And I want to make sure that you are getting the most value possible out of this session. So with that end in mind, we're going to be using the text chat feature extensively throughout the presentation to keep it very interactive and participative. So if I could get everyone to really quickly jump into the text chat and simply type the word hi. Just type the word hi to let me know you can hear my voice. The audio is coming through loud and clear. You are listening and engaged and ready to rock. Wonderful. <clears throat> that is great. So let me start first by asking this question. What do you think it means to have a positive attitude? Okay, so type into the text chat one or two or three descriptive words. What does that mean to have a positive attitude? Just curious what you think. Go ahead and do that now. Be optimistic, to always look on the bright side, to be optimistic about challenges, to have a light and easy mindset. Absolutely. Look at the bright side. Nice things happen. Seeing the good in every situation. Great examples, folks. Great examples. To be hopeful. Yes. Absolutely. Wonderful. Now, let me ask you this yes or no question. So get ready to type yes or no in the chat. Is it possible that you can take two people, put them in the exact same circumstance, have the same thing happen to them simultaneously, and yet they have wildly different reactions? One person's very upset, the other person's totally fine. Yes or no? Is that possible? Yes, absolutely. You can take two people, be in the same circumstance, they have different reactions. In fact, we ourselves can be reacting differently from one day to the next, one minute to the next. I'm reminded of an example. Years ago, my brother getting married in Vancouver, Canada, and I was very excited to go visit, to be part of the ceremony, to be his best man, but also because I am a passionate, avid indoor rock climber. And I thought, Vancouver, this is going to be incredible. British Columbia, there's some huge mountains. We're going to go mountain climbing. So I hire lead climbing guy Jeff. And we begin to ascend a 500-foot sheer rock face going up the North Apron of Big Chief and Squamish. There's no safety net. There's no one making sure that we're okay. We're just tied to each other, hanging on little anchors the size of the tip of my thumb called cams driven into the rock. And we're just doing this up the side of the mountain. Well, about 300 feet up, I'm anchored in. Jeff is ascending. And I lean back and soak in the view. And folks, it was breathtaking. I was so excited, so just exhilarated to be living this moment. I take out my camera, snap a photograph looking sideways. I say, wow, I'm 300 feet up. This is amazing. I'm living one of my dreams. And then I turn my camera and I point it straight down. And all of a sudden, all of my happy emotions vanish in an instant. And they were replaced with some brand new emotions. So in the text chat, Type, what brand new emotions do you think I started to feel 300 feet up a sheer rock face looking straight down? Was I feeling happy? Was I feeling peace, calm, serenity? No, I was feeling fear, stark raving terror. Exactly. So here's my question to you. What changed? What changed from one moment where I was 300 feet up feeling joy and excitement to the next moment where I was 300 feet up feeling terror? Did something physically change? Did my rope start to fray? Did the anchors come out of the rock? Did my harness come undone? Did anything physical change? Nothing physically changed, but something changed. No, I, I knew I was 300 feet up. I, I knew the reality that I was 300 feet up, but I was happy. <laughs> my perspective changed. My viewpoint, the way that I was looking at the circumstance, the story that I was telling myself because a moment earlier, I was telling myself, I'm 300 feet up living my dream. And then that story changed. It was now, I'm 300 feet up, and I'm going to die. That's what changed. That's the story. And so we can change our emotional reaction. We can change our experience of the situation 
Nothing external needs to change. Simply how we feel can change by the story we tell ourselves. In fact, I was getting ready to, um, I was doing a talk for another organization on managing holiday stress. And, you know, my grandmother is 96 years old, 96. And we live an hour from her. We're going to the holiday season. And, and I know we're going to be driving across the city. It'll be snowy, bad weather, traffic, accidents. We're going to be slogging through all of this. And some people might be doing kind of a similar journey, traveling an hour through terrible traffic and terrible weather to see their family. And their reaction might be, oh, I have to do this. There's another way of looking at this. Wow, I am so grateful my grandmother is still alive, 96. I get to travel to see her. I get to spend time with her. I get to go through traffic to treasure and savor these, these last times that we have together. I don't know how long she'll live. My grandfather passed away at 95. My um, Her sister, my grandmother's sister, lived 102, but 96, that's, that's really getting up there. So every time we get the opportunity to spend time with her is a priceless, irreplaceable treasure, despite the traffic and weather. Give me a yes if that makes sense. We can be in the same circumstance and begrudge the, the inconvenience, or we can say, wow, I am so grateful she's still here. We get to spend the afternoon with her. And it's the same situation. It comes down to the way you choose to look at it, the story you tell yourself. <laughs> now, the greatest example I've ever heard of this is from Viktor Frankl. Dr. Viktor Frankl wrote a book, Man's Search for Meaning. And I've read the book twice, and it is not a fun book to read. It's a very emotionally difficult book to read because he is a survivor from a concentration camp in World War II, lost his whole family. But he was a Viennese, or sorry, an Austrian psychiatrist. <laughs> and so losing everything, losing everyone in this concentration camp, he started to notice, and he wrote this in his book, he started to notice that there was a pattern. He could see a pattern that some people were more adept at surviving than others. And with nothing but his own suffering to occupy him, but his mind, as a trained psychiatrist, he noticed behavioral differences. And one of the things that he saw was that the people, generally speaking, that were more adept at surviving seemed to, and I'm going to simplify this, seemed to have a more positive attitude. Well, how did they express that? Well, they would console each other. They would put their arm around each other and say, somehow we'll get out of here. Someday someone will rescue us. This isn't going to be like this forever. And they would share their last little piece of bread. They would reminisce about a better time. They'd tell a story. They'd try to do something to make the other person smile. They would try to look at, you know, hey, do you remember that great time where we had this great food, the ball game we saw? They would try to see anything good in the circumstance. And one day, he was struck by a vision. He was struck by a vision of himself standing on stage speaking, like giving a, a lecture in a university hall. And he saw himself clean-shaven, dressed, clean suit and tie, talking to this audience, telling the story of what he was going through. And the vision just struck him like a thunderbolt. It was so vivid, so real, and so compelling. He resolved in that moment, I must survive. I must survive this terrible experience so that I can make this vision come true. I can stand on stage and tell the story of what had happened. And so he was able to get through this terrible experience with, among other tools, the tool of having a compelling vision for his future. And in fact, this was such a strong thing that he actually created an entire field of therapy called logotherapy. And the foundational tenet of logotherapy is that one of the tools, not the only tool, but one of the tools to offset depression is to have an overriding sense of cause, a mission something that is greater than you. For example, my wife is the executive director of a youth charity, not a charity, a youth nonprofit, helping homeless kids, 16-year-old homeless kids. And there are days where she is tired. There are days where she's frustrated, days where she's hurt and disappointed. And when she's feeling tired and broken down, she musters the energy because she realizes, I'm helping kids. And so when we've got this vision, this internal cause that's bigger than us, 
we can move forward. <laughs> and so we can kind of dwell on, you know, why do I have to fill in this report? Why do I have to work these hours? This isn't fair that I'm going through this. Or we can supersede that. We can override that saying, I'm willing to go through this to help other people. And so Viktor Frankl, in this landmark book, Man's Search for Meaning, sharing all of these principles, wrote a phrase. And this is how I came to know about the book. Wrote a phrase that just hit me like a ton of bricks. And Stephen Covey quoted this phrase in his own landmark book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And he said this, quoting Viktor Frankl, between stimulus and response is the freedom to choose. So between the thing happening and how we feel about the thing happening, there's a little split second moment where you have freedom. You get to choose the way you think. You see, he realized, Viktor Frankl, in this terrible circumstance, that the Germans could do anything they wanted to his body, but they couldn't make him think a certain way. It was the very last little piece of real estate that he got to hold on to. He got to choose what to think about. When everything else material was stripped away from him, he realized that was the very last of the human freedoms. You get to choose in any external circumstance what you're thinking about. Nobody else can make you do that. No circumstance, nothing can make you think a certain way. You get to control that. You're always in the driver's seat for that. And so we wrote the last of the human freedoms is to get to choose our attitude under any given set of circumstances. Now, sometimes we all might face a terrible circumstance. I don't know all of your names. I don't know your individual stories, but I know for a fact everyone has been hurt. Everyone will continue to be hurt. We will all face joy and happiness and love and passion and adventure, and we will all face tragedy. We will all face heartbreak. We will all face terrible trauma. That's life. That's the human experience. It's a roller coaster, up and down, up and down, up and down. We have good days and bad days. We will all face that. And so when we face those things, it seems and can seem quite unfair and quite overwhelming. CJ, you don't understand. This bad thing happened to me. It's making me feel bad. No. No. What the story is in our head is making us feel bad. I'll give you an example. Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison, very famous inventor. This guy had, beside his house, he had a huge barn, okay, a little bit down the road, huge barn, and the barn was being used for all of his experiments. It was his laboratory. And there's all these chemicals and all this stuff going on. And one day, the barn, late at night, like 10 at night, explodes. Nobody's in it, nobody's hurt, but the barn explodes. And 30 foot high flames, and with all the chemicals, the flames were blue and, and red and green, just out of Game of Thrones, these flames. It was unbelievable. And so one of the sons comes running, Dad, 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 the, um, the barn is on fire. The barn has exploded, Dad. And Thomas Edison runs out and sees all of his life work going up in flames, devastating his fortune being wiped out in front of him. And he turns to his son and he says, son, go get your mom. She'll never see another fire like this again. And the next day in all of the ashes, walking around through all of the ashes, Thomas Edison turns to all of his staff, all of his family and neighbors, and he says, thank goodness for the fire. Thank goodness for the fire because it has erased all of our mistakes. Thank goodness for the fire. It has erased all of our mistakes. Now we can begin again. I was watching a Dr. Phil episode. I love Dr. Phil. And he was talking to a family member who had lost somebody. The, the person had passed away. <laughs> and this family member was racked with grief and mourning, understandably. And Dr. Phil shared this, shared, you know, if, if I, as Dr. Phil, if I passed away, I would want my, my wife, my sons to mourn for me, but after a period of time, I wouldn't want to know that they were in pain all the time. I would want their pain to abate. I would want them to miss me. I'd want them to mourn me. But after a while, I wouldn't want that to be their 24-7 life experience. I would want them to find joy. I would want them to celebrate my life. 
I would want them to think about the times that we had together, that we were laughing, that we had wonderful family adventures together, that we were cuddling to the couch and and having tickle fights and and uh, and and doing wonderful, fun things, playing games and building a tree fort and all the great memories. I wouldn't want the only tape in their head to be me passing away and how they felt sad about that. I would want that to be a little part of it and all of the rest of it, joy and happy memories. Because if I could look down on them suffering and see that all they were focused on was the sadness of me passing away, I would want to flip a switch for them and say, listen, don't, don't be dwelling just in the sadness, celebrate the happiness as well. And I, I might say this the wrong way, but Dr. Seuss had a way of saying this, and I might misquote this, but this is the basic idea, is don't just look back and feel bad about what we've lost but look back and celebrate what we had. Celebrate the good memories and be appreciative of that. Give me a yes if that idea makes sense. Okay. There's a movie that came out by Dennis Villeneuve starring Amy Adams and Jeremy Renner. Science fiction movie. Uh, so Dennis Villeneuve did Dune um, and Blade Runner 2049. Amazing director. And he did this movie, Arrival, okay? So you may or may not have seen Arrival. Um, it is worth seeing, and it's been out for, I don't know, 10 years at this point. Uh, but it's worth seeing. And so <clears throat> the, there's a mom, and she has lost her daughter. So the first minute of the movie is her daughter, they're, they're playing, the daughter's five, the daughter's 10, then the daughter's 15 and has got cancer in the, in the hospital. And then... How oh, we're going to get to how you can better control your minds. That's why we're here today. But uh, Amy Adams in Arrival, the beginning of the movie, looking at having fun with her daughter and celebrating the daughter, then the daughter gets cancer and passes away. And it cuts to a shot of Amy Adams alone in the house, sad, grieving. And the arc of the movie, the main question at the end of the movie is, if you knew all of the pain that you would suffer from losing your 15-year-old daughter, would you still want to go through all of the pain of losing her so that you could have all of the joy from when she was a baby and three and five and 10 where you're running around playing with each other? And the choice that Amy Adams says, yes, I would, despite the pain, I would still want all of the joy that having my daughter brought into my life. And so this is one of the things that Dr. Victor Frankl talks about, is that despite the external circumstance, we get to choose. We get to choose the story that we tell ourselves. So how do we do this? Well, first of all, a positive attitude is not denying reality. A positive attitude is not rose-colored glasses ignoring information. You know, like if you are uh, on a plane and it's like a Hollywood action movie and the engines have blown the uh, wings have come off, the front of the plane with the cockpit, that part's gone, the tail, that part's gone, and you're in your chair and you're looking straight out, you know, saying to yourself, I'm sure it'll be fine. That's not positive. That's delusional. <laughs> if if the wings are gone, now we're like, well, you know, th this is kind of it. Okay? <clears throat> so a positive attitude does not deny reality. It recognizes reality. But here's the thing that we need to realize about reality is that in every single circumstance, there's something good and something bad. And a positive attitude recognizes the good. We don't need any practice at all noticing what's wrong. Give me a yes in the chat if you know anyone that's an expert at pointing out what's wrong, complaining about what's wrong. Oh, that's wrong. That's wrong. That's wrong. They're very good at complaining about what's wrong, like they've got a storm cloud that follows them around, okay? So a positive attitude is not Pollyanna, just la, 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 just noticing everything happy. It doesn't deny reality. It recognizes, yeah, we're, we are experts, yeah. It recognizes that each situation has something good and something bad, and it's an intellectual choice to notice what is good. Your brain doesn't need practice noticing what is bad. So what's the benefit of this? You know, you've heard the phrase, the glass is half empty versus the glass is half full. They're both true, which is part of what messes up negative people is that it is true that the glass is half empty. It is also simultaneously true that the glass is also half full. So what would be the benefit 
What's the benefit of having a positive attitude? What do you think? Throw your answers in the chat. What is the benefit? Why should we bother? You feel better about life, less stress, less stress. You're happier. For sure, you're happier. You're in a better mood, a greater mindset. Absolutely. In fact, uh, Tony Robbins was talking about this. The quality of your life is your emotional experience of life. And what he means by that is, let's say you ask the average person on the street, what would you like to make your life happy? And they'd say, oh, winning the lottery, big mansion, Lamborghini, yacht, helicopter, you know, travel, great restaurants, food, stuff, okay? So imagine, snap your fingers, you've got that. Mansion, Lamborghini, yacht, but you are clinically depressed. What's the quality of your life? You don't care that you have a mansion. You don't care that you have a Lamborghini. If the quality of your emotional experience all day long is anger at other people, you know, you're driving your car, somebody cuts you off, or just sadness, or just crippling anxiety, or envy, oh, that's not fair, my sibling got this, my bridesmaid looks fancier than me, oh, my buddy from high school has a nicer cottage, whatever. If we are just crushed by negative emotions, that's the quality of your life. And the flip side is also true. What if you have a little tiny one-room house, you, you don't even have a car, you have a bicycle, but you and you get like a loaf of bread and water and lunch meat in the fridge, but you feel happier. Who's got the better life? The billionaire who's crippled with anxiety, envy, anger, rage, hate, sadness, grief, or the person with a one room bedroom apartment and a bicycle and a loaf of bread that is happy? Who's got the better life? What do you think? Because some people will say, oh, the billionaire who's miserable. So this is something we need to answer for ourselves. The quality of your life is the quality of your emotional experience. We don't want to wake up angry all the time, scared all the time, sad all the time. So there's a lot of benefits. First of all, <coughs> helps you see what's good in the circumstance, helps you take action when there's an obstacle. One of the reasons that I, I built and led sales teams, and anytime there's a problem, this is what separates you from the competition. Problems are good. When you think about the most successful people in the world, this is a way of looking at this. You get paid in proportion to the size and complexity of the problem you solve. You get paid in size and complexity of the problem you solve. So if you solve an incredibly huge, incredibly complicated problem that affects a lot of people, you're going to be paid a lot of money. If you don't really solve any big problem, you're not going to be paid a lot of money. That's kind of a, a general principle for success in life. Okay. So what we want to do is we want to attack problems. We want to address problems. So the a problem, my brain is like, oh, that's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to solve the problem and be successful solving it. Okay. Uh, Tony Robbins shared a story. He had bought an island. Uh, I'm going to mispronounce the island, but I think it's Namali, but I might be mispronouncing it, but it's in the uh, um, South Pacific. And he buys this island and it's got 20 huts, luxury, luxury resort, like Richard Branson stays at this place, incredibly expensive luxury resort. And he buys the island. And in the process of buying it, he notices all the people and I, I can't now remember if they're Polynesians, but I believe it's in the South Pacific Islands is where his his island is, Tony Robbins' private island. And as he's talking with everyone, all these people comparatively financially are very poor, extremely poor. Okay, So they build their own shelter, hunt for their own food, super poor. Okay, They, they have no material possessions. But every night they're singing. They're singing songs. They're laughing and singing. And he's talking, as he's doing this, he's talking with some of these villagers living there, and they tell about, you know, people that have been to the island before that are billionaires. And they say to these billionaires, why are you a billionaire? 
and these billionaires are looking at buying the island. And the guy says, well, why are you a billionaire? And the guy says, well, I, I wanted to build a company so I could make a lot of money. Okay, well, why did you want to make a lot of money? And he says, so I can um, so I can uh, buy my freedom. I've got more choices in my life. So I can buy a nice house, nice car. I can buy a nice island. Well, why do you want to buy a nice island? Well, so that I, I can be here on the island because it's nice. Well, what about is it makes you nice? Well, it's free from all the stress and all the pressure. And I can sit on the beach and sing songs. And the, the people living there say, we already have that. <laughs> We're already on the island laughing and singing songs. So the billionaire is taking this long route to arrive at being happy. It's amazing. So many of our decisions are just avoiding pain and going towards pleasure. I want to be happy. Do you know you're able to be happy right now? Instantaneously. Right now. Watch anything funny. Anything that makes you laugh, surge of endorphins, immediately your day just got better. By watching a five-minute YouTube clip of your favorite comedy show, your day just got better. Costs you nothing outside of buying the cell phone. Okay? Or reading a funny joke. Just the endorphins. Immediately your quality of life is better. So when we face a challenge, we can look at the challenge and say, I'm going to turn this around to an opportunity. Okay? Helps you be creative no matter what th life throws at you. As well, when we have a more positive attitude, see, stress is debilitating for our immune system, compromises our immune system. So being more positive, reducing stress, boosts your immune system. As well, when you got a positive attitude, you're more fun to be around. If you're a grumpy, ornery bump on a log, you, you are not fun to be around, okay? And so another thing is we tend to go after what we believe is possible. Like, again, I, I would lead sales teams. And if a salesperson literally believed there's no point in calling that client, they're going to say no. So the salesperson wouldn't call the client and it would generate no sale. And this is the biggest thing I would try to talk. Salespeople struggle with rejection and managing emotionally, mentally managing rejection. I would say, help me with this. If you don't call the client, you generate no sales you have a 100% chance of generating no sales. But if you call the client, there's a chance they say no and a chance they say yes. Simplicity, let's call it 50%. If you call the client, there's a 50% chance you'll get money. If you don't call the client, it's a 100% chance you get nothing. Why wouldn't you call them? Well, because they might say no. Yes, but they've already said no if you don't call. <laughs> It's an automatic no. Okay, give me a yes if that makes sense. If I don't try or I try and fail, it's the same result. But if I try and win, I got a chance of making it. It has never made sense to me to not take action. Question here is engaging in activity more than just a means of diverting attention from the current situation. No. I don't engage in spending time with my son to divert me from stress. I, I engage in spending time with my son because it makes me happy. I don't take my wife out on a date because I'm trying to distract myself from I need to mow the lawn. I take my wife on a date because it intrinsically makes me happy. However, if we are stressed, a tool in the toolbox that can be very helpful is to, in the moment, distract yourself because in the moment, we may not be capable of re-scripting our thoughts, and to change our focus can give ourselves a little bit of a break, let the adrenaline settle, so we can look at the problem with a little bit calmer mind, okay? So if we're super stressed, we can use distraction as a temporary tool. It's not a long-term tool, but a temporary tool to calm our mind down, because then we can absolutely take action. What if I will be better prepared later? What if I will be better prepared later? I'm not sure what that means. It's good to be better prepared later. Um, give me an example, because I, I don't understand uh, the comment. What if I will be better prepared later? Um, just paint a picture for me so I can, I can address that for you. Anyway, so there's absolute powerful positivity with managing a positive attitude. Now, all of this comes down to something called cognitive behavioral therapy. You've probably heard this phrase before, CBT. Cognitive behavioral therapy is a therapy uh, model that the foundational tenant is your thinking shapes your emotional response, which leads to your emotional and behavioral reaction, okay? 
the situation is I won't call the client today because I want to prepare myself. Oh, okay. That's what you mean. <clears throat> okay. So let's say I was talking with the salesperson about that. And maybe they said, I want to practice a little bit more before I call. That's not a bad thing. So for example, I play the piano. I'm all for practice. Okay. So what I would do with that person, let's say it's a brand new salesperson. <coughs> I'd say, okay, well, let's practice. Let's get your skill up. And I practice for a while. And then I would say, okay, now you're ready. Let's make the call. Okay, so there's a time and place for practice for sure. But we want to be very conscious of, am I making up a reason to not call, you know, practice, I need to get better. Or am I engaging in perfectionism, procrastination? I need to be perfect at making a sales call before I go make the call. Because a lot of people will do that. They've got perfectionism, procrastination. The way that you learn is you do. And so the way you learn a piano song, you play and you make a lot of mistakes, okay? So there's, to a degree, some practice involved. My son's 16, he's getting his G1. We are going to practice, but we're going to practice in controlled spaces. We're going to practice in parking. We've been doing that now, but practicing in parking lots, gradually getting him up. And then, you know, as he gets his G1, now he'll be able to be on streets. And we will very basically take, I'm going to take him out on just a couple of neighborhood streets, you know, some some streets out in the country where it's there's not a lot of risk of accident, building his his expertise up. But I will not allow him to say, okay, the way that I'm going to practice is reading the manual. I'm going to read that for another 10 years. No, nope. read the manual to know the rules, pass the online test to know the rules. Now you're getting behind the wheel. Because being in your head, being afraid of something, if you are afraid of something and do not take action, the fear grows. When you take action, you confront the fear. Maybe you get a little feedback to improve, but you confront the fear and you, it's like turning a, a, a light on and cockroaches scurry away. Take action in the face of fear. So CBT, your thoughts lead to your emotions, lead to your behavioral reaction, okay? So I'll give you an example. Years ago, my wife and I were stuck in the elevator of our condominium. So my wife, myself, third lady, three of us in the elevator. Elevator jammed, stuck between two floors. My wife starts getting frustrated. She's like, this is ridiculous. Can't believe the elevator stuck again. It's so unprofessional. I am cracking jokes. I'm like, ah, escape hatch in the roof. This is like a Tom Cruise action movie. Mission Impossible. Doop, doop, doop. So I'm cracking jokes. Because when you crack a joke, you change your focus. You minimize the mountain down to the actual molehill that it really is. And you get a surge of endorphins to help calm you down. So I'm cracking jokes. The lady beside me doesn't find any of my jokes funny. Because she has claustrophobia. So she is having a full-on panic attack. Now we get off the elevator. Here's the thing to understand. We are all in the same situation. And we are having totally different emotional responses. My wife is annoyed. I find it funny. The lady beside me is panicking. So if the situation is identical, what's the variable? Your thoughts are the variable. What you think. So if we interview my wife, what were you thinking? She was thinking, oh, this is inconvenient. This is unprofessional. I can't believe they've they've uh, not maintained the elevator. They've inconvenienced us. I have every right to be angry. You asked me, what was I thinking? I was thinking, yeah, this is no big deal. We'll get out of here soon enough. Besides, it'll make for a funny story later. Now, what was the lady with claustrophobia thinking? And this is how you can elicit your thoughts. You can say, I'm in an elevator, and what is going to happen is dot, dot, dot. So fill in the blank. What, what was she saying? I'm in an elevator. What is going to happen is, what do you think? Type your answer in the chat. What was she saying to herself in her mind? What is going to happen to me is, we are all going to die. That's what she was saying. I'm in immediate mortal danger. The cable's going to snap. We're going to fall. The walls are closing in. We're never getting out. We're trapped forever. We're running out of air. We're in danger. We're going to die. So my question to you is, was being in the elevator making her stressed or was her thought, I'm going to die, making her stressed? Was it the situation or her thought? What do you think? Because remember, the situation was the same for all three of us. It was her thoughts. So how do you change your thoughts? Well, her phobia, but a phobia is just a way of thinking. Okay, so, you know, so what are you thinking? So the phobia is this thing is going to cause me harm. 
this thing is going to cause me danger. This is dangerous. Okay. So now the phobia might have been triggered by trauma. She might have been trapped in an elevator for 24 hours when she was three years old. Buildings on fire. That'll anchor in a, a memory in your amygdala. Any emotion, any experience, by the way, that has intense phys intense emotion gets prioritized in your memory. So it might have been a bad experience, but she's not going through that right now. She's just in an elevator. She's perfectly safe. But the elevator is triggering her memory. And her memory is, oh, my goodness, this reminds me of when I was in danger. And you know what? Now I believe right now I'm in danger. It all comes down to your thoughts. So we've got to separate the reality of the situation versus our story. So how do we do that? How do we separate the reality of the circumstance, the facts, versus the story we're telling ourselves? Because we tend to think that our story is a fact. It isn't. We think our stories are actual facts. So I'll give you an example. One of my pet peeves as I'm driving my, my car on the road is cars that speed and swerve aggressively, driving aggressively, aggressive lane changes. That bugs me. Because I look at that and I say, oh, that reminds me of the thoughtless punk jerk that drove his car right through an intersection and wiped out a minivan with a family. All pronounced at the scene, this kid's in jail for 20 years. That's what this behavior is reminding me of. Okay, so let's say you see a car driving really aggressively. Well, you take in all the information, Sensory information, visual, auditory, kinesthetic, olfactory, gustatory. You compare it to all of your knowledge, all of your experience to answer one question. What am I looking at? What does it mean to me? And then you generate a story. And your story might be, I know what I'm looking at. Some thoughtless punk teenage jerk doesn't care if he hurts innocent people. How dare he? So what emotion does that thought create? Anger. Anytime your values are violated, you feel anger. So now imagine in this scenario, you're feeling angry. You see the car, you're like, oh, terrible driver. And the car comes up beside you. And now for the first time, you can see inside the car. Folks, what might be a reason why a car might be driving fast and you wouldn't feel anger at the driver? You'd feel compassion and concern and forgiveness towards the driver. What do you think? Why might a car be driving fast and you would forgive them? Medical emergency. They're rushing to the hospital, exactly. If you can see, oh, it's the mom in labor, dad's having a heart attack, kids bleeding all over the place. If you can see that, what happens to your anger? Evaporates because your story changed. The behavior didn't change. The situation didn't change. Your story changed. Now, here's the challenge. Most of the time, you don't get to see inside the car. The car dips, disappears into the distance. And now you're left with a choice. You get to choose to invent an ugly story, or you get to choose to invent a forgiving story. If you choose to invent an ugly story, they're a jerk, you will feel an ugly emotion. If you choose to invent a forgiving story, oh my goodness, they're rushing to the hospital, you will have a forgiving emotion. You don't have direct control over your emotions. You have you have indirect control by having direct control over your thoughts. If you choose to tell yourself a good story about the circumstance, you will feel a good emotion, period. Okay? So how do we start to do that? Well, your brain's a camera. Think of this analogy. Whatever you focus on is what you see. If you focus on what is wrong, you're going to notice what's wrong. So I want you to do this right now. I want you to look around the room where you're sitting and notice every single thing that's red. Okay, so look around the room. That light there is red. That icon is red. That's red. The can's red. The Kleenex is red. The box there is red. The book is red. Red, red, red. Okay, notice everything that's red. Good. Now here's what I want you to do. I want you to close your eyes and in your memory... Scan you the room that you just scanned and notice everything you just saw that's green. Ah, in your memory only, scan the room again, notice everything that is green. Mm. Okay, now open your eyes and now deliberately look around the room. KMTZ, KM on the Zoom chat, that's green. Green, green, the Excel icon is green. That book there is green. What else is green? Green, 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 green. That box there is green. 
Green, green, green. Magazine there is green. Now, give me a yes in the chat if you noticed more green the second time when you asked yourself, notice what is green. Of course, here's what's ironic. Your eyes saw all of that. The Zoom, your screen sharing, the new share, that's green. Your eyes saw all of the green before, but you didn't notice it. It was all there. Here's another one. Let's say you're a fireman. You walk into a room. And if you're a fireman, what do you notice? You notice the smoke detector. You notice the fire alarm. You notice the sprinklers in the ceiling. You notice the exit signs. You notice anything that might be flammable. If a doorway is blocked, if the exits are safe, you notice all of that. What if you walk into the same room and you're, you're an interior decorator? What do you notice? You don't care about the sprinklers. You care about the colors. You care about the lighting. You care about the layout, the energy, the furniture, the art, the paintings on the wall. That's what you notice. It's the same room, but you're looking at the room through different eyes. Here's another one, final one. I drive a Hyundai Elantra, and I noticed something interesting happened when I bought my Hyundai, that all of a sudden, that week that I bought my car, a hundred other Hyundai Elantras were all over the road. The same car that I just bought all over the place. Now, there's two possibilities. Possibility one. Yeah, give me a yes in the chat if you had the same experience when you bought your car. You had the same experience? Yeah. The same car all over the place. <coughs> Crazy, eh? Here's the thing that's going on. There's two choices. Choice number one. You are a very famous Instagram influencer, and the news went out, you bought the car, and everyone wants to copy you because you're famous and cool. Option number two. The car's were always there, you just didn't notice until you told yourself this is important to notice. It's the second one, okay? Whatever you choose to notice, you're going to see. My son, we, we did up his room. He was going from grade seven to grade eight. He'd had the same room since he was a little guy. And my wife is a good little artist and she painted Disney characters, ABCs, one, two, three, so A uh, for whatever she posted, um, Apple, I don't know. Then B was uh, Bambi, and C was Cars, Lightning McQueen, and D was Dalmatians, and E was Elephant, Dumbo. Okay, so she's put all these ABCs, 1, 2, 3s around the room. Beautiful paintings, but it's a baby room. And he'd been in that room till he was 12, getting ready almost to high school. We said, you know, but it's time to get like a high school room. And so we get him all new furniture, cool lighting, cool technology. Just the room was the coolest room in the house. And as I'm rushing to get the room done, rush, 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 rush. Three o'clock in the morning, there's a little dab of paint in the ceiling I didn't notice. A little bit of primer on the ceiling. And I noticed the next morning, but I'm rush, 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 and I know, oh, I've got to fix that. But then the furniture arrives, set it all up, and I don't fix it. The room was the coolest room in the house when we set it up. Still pretty cool. But every time I walk into the room, do you think I notice all the cool furniture, all the cool electronics, all the cool stuff we set up for this kid? The coolest teenage bedroom imaginable. Nope. My eyes go right to the one thing that's wrong, the little blemish, the little dot of paint on the ceiling, right to the negative. 99% of the room is amazing, 1% little dot of paint, and my brain just sees the negative. That's a negative attitude. Choose instead to ask yourself, what is good in this situation? What is great in this? Okay. So what happens for us is we engage in cognitive distortions. This is all from a book, by the way, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy book called Feeling Good. And these are patterns of thinking that are irrational. So if you really want to dive into this, grab the book, okay? So we can engage in all sorts of patterns. Personalizing. Somebody walks by, they're angry. You personalize it. Oh, I know what they're angry at. They're angry at me. You don't know that, but that's personalizing magnification or minimization, magnification. I got 99% or sorry, magnification. This is a little problem like being caught in the elevator. It's a life-threatening catastrophic problem. We take something very small and make it very big. In fact, this is such a common cognitive distortion. We've got a phrase, making a mountain out of a molehill. That's what that cognitive distortion is. All or nothing thinking, you get 99 on an exam, a test, you failed. If I didn't get perfect, I failed. If I got silver medal in the Olympics, I failed, okay? Discounting the positives. 20 people give you a compliment. You know, oh, your, your food at Christmas dinner was amazing. 
one person gives a criticism. My mom does this. 20 people are like, oh, the food's great. My grandmother, 96, says, mm, it's too salty. My mom deletes all the positives, only hears the one criticism, and gets sad about it. I'm like, mom, everyone loved the food. She's like, no, it was too salty. Mind reading. Oh, I know what the other person's thinking. No, you don't. <laughs> if you know what the other person's thinking, let's go to Las Vegas. I'll pay for the airfare, hotel, food for three days. You just tell me what the blackjack dealer is thinking. You don't know what people are thinking. Okay. Labeling. That's another one. Oh, I'm I'm a failure. You do one thing wrong, you label yourself. I'm a failure. Okay. These are terrible cognitive distortions. So how do we change this? You ask yourself positive questions. The way you notice what is green, the way you notice all the good things in the circumstance, the way you notice and feel gratitude driving across the city in bad traffic to see your 96-year-old grandmother, the way you notice what is good is you ask yourself a positive question. A question forces your focus. And by being intentional, asking a positive question, you force your focus onto something good. So how do you do it? What is great about this? What's good about this? What? How will this make me stronger and wiser? What's funny about this? Why do I feel grateful about this? You can kind of shape the quality of answer you get based upon the quality of question you ask. For example, if you're in a relationship, you're married. If you ask yourself, what is everything my spouse do does that bugs me? You're going to get one list of answers. If, however, you ask yourself, that's a bad question. If you ask yourself a good question, what's everything my spouse does that makes me feel so happy and so loved? You're going to get a whole other different list of answers. The quality of the question kind of predetermines the quality of the answer. So start asking good questions. What is good about this? That's literally the ball game. That's how you have a positive attitude. Somebody asked earlier, how do you rescript your thinking? You deliberately, consciously ask, what is good about this? What is good? And you look for what is good. So let's do it in a little example. Let's say average office worker, 4.30, boss walks by, or boss walks by lunchtime and says, hey, Bob, how you doing? Listen, I'd like to talk to you. Please be in my office at 4.30 today and please bring your laptop. And then the boss walks away. I've got a meeting, got to run. Now, what do you think the average office worker thinks is going to happen to them at 4.30? Are they thinking, oh, rainbows and lollipops, that's what's going to happen. Doves will take flight. Type in the text chat, what do you think the average person thinks is going to happen? We survey a million people. What do you think? I'm getting fired. Bad things are going to happen going to get terminated, okay? So these are not good things. So how do we change it? Well, first of all, where there's smoke, there's fire. You notice you're not feeling good. Oh, okay, I'm not feeling good. Uh, oh, really? <laughs> okay, so I'll give you a, a, a workaround for that, okay? So you notice you're feeling stressed. You figure out, well, what was the triggering event? Well, the boss walking by saying, see me at 430, that was the triggering event. Okay. So what story did I tell myself? This is where you need to take out a journal or a piece of paper and a pen and write down what story did I tell myself? I told myself at 4.30, what's going to happen is, just like the lady in the elevator, what's going to happen is dot, dot, dot. What's going to happen is I'm getting fired. I'm getting in trouble. Okay. So now you have elicited your subconscious thought. Now we have to rewrite the thought. This is positive attitude. This is what it is. So you rewrite the thought by asking a positive question. What could be good? In this circumstance, what could happen at 4.30 that could be good? So we've got uh, 32 people online. I want every single person to type something in the text chat. What could happen at 4.30 that could be good? Getting promoted. Yeah, what else? Getting a raise. Getting some extra time off. Great examples. What else? What else could happen that could be good? Or how about at least not bad? Working under your boss. Yeah, doing some work. What else? After work, we get to we get together. We have to leave early to go to have fun. A great performance review. A mentorship session. Yeah. These are great examples. Getting a new job today, getting an extra little piece of work, or hey, we've got a job lined up for you, for sure. 
you know, it could be a question. Hey, listen, I don't know how to do this on Excel. Could you show me? It could be, listen, I was going to do the meeting tomorrow, but I've got dental surgery. Can you take over the meeting? I'm going to walk you through it. It could be, I want to do a, a three-way meeting, Zoom, but my camera's broken. Bring your laptop so we can work on, on it together. It could be, I want to brainstorm about a new project. That's a really good reframe. If I get fired, I will have the chance to find a better job. That's a very positive, powerful reframe. Uh, but our brain is hardwired to go to the negative, genetically hardwired to go to the negative. So you're not weak or bad or, or strange if you think negative thoughts. It's a survival technique to hear the twig snap and think it's a bear because that keeps you alive to evade danger, Okay, which serves you 5,000 years ago, but it doesn't serve you today. Not really, not to the way it used to. Okay. There's a hundred things. How about you're getting a new laptop? It could be a hundred things, okay? So what you do is you write down the possible negative thing. I'm getting in trouble. Then you write down 37 positive things. And you look at this and say, what is the statistical likelihood that the bad thing is going to happen? That's eh, like 3%. What's the likelihood the good thing's gonna happen? Wow, 97%, okay. But my emotional reaction is I'm reacting as if it's 100% likely that I'm having the worst thing happen, getting fired. And I'm totally discounting all the other things. So what we want to do is we want to list these out to create a little bit of cognitive dissonance to create some uncertainty about our earlier assertion that I'm getting fired. We want to create uncertainty. Maybe I'm not getting fired. Maybe my reaction was a little too fast. Maybe it's something else. So listing all these possibilities, you can create some uncertainty. Then say to yourself, have I done this to myself before? Is this a pattern of behavior for me where potentially something bad could happen and I get all wound up and stressed out and I ruin my whole day worrying? Then I get to the 430 meeting and it's nothing. It's, uh, yeah, can you show me how to do this email? I just want to check in with the ABC project, see how it's doing. Like literally nothing. And then you're mad at yourself for wrecking your whole day worrying. So, oh, you know what? I have a pattern doing this. I get myself wound up and then nothing bad happens and I wreck my whole day worrying. I've done this a hundred times before. So there's probably a chance I'm doing it right now. Okay. Now, what if you try to go through this exercise and you're still stressed? You're still worrying. CJ, you don't understand how loud the voice is shouting in my ear. You're getting fired, getting fired, getting fired, getting fired. What if you've even had past history? I got fired four times before. Getting fired, getting fired, okay? So how do you combat that? Here's the final question you ask. What is my evidence that the bad thing will happen? What is my evidence? Not this happened four times before. What's my evidence right now in this circumstance the bad thing's going to happen? So maybe, because bad things happen, maybe you do have evidence. Maybe you've been late 30 days in a row. The boss has said, if you're late again, you're getting fired and you were, or you're getting in trouble and you were late again. Now you have evidence, <laughs> okay? Uh, if the company got bought and 100 people go into the boss's office before you and they all come out crying, saying they've been laid off and you're next, well, then you have evidence. But let's say you ask yourself, what is my evidence the bad thing's going to happen, and you can't come up with anything. You're like, I haven't made any mistakes, not aware of anyone upset, haven't let anyone down. There's nothing going on. I have no evidence for something bad happening. Then guess what, folks? Probably nothing bad's going to happen. And you need to say, I'm probably making myself a little bit wound up. And I can use techniques like deep breathing to calm my physiology down. I can use techniques like journaling, get my thoughts on paper. You should be doing that anyway. I can use laughter distract myself, to calm myself down, surge of endorphins, calm myself down. Okay, so these are good things. And so that's how you handle it. You ask yourself a positive question. You list out all the possibilities. You say to yourself, is this a pattern of behavior that I wound myself up? And do I have any evidence of the bad thing happening? What else can we do just as a general prescriptive global thing? We can pour good things into our brain you know, my uh, son right now, he's 16. He's fallen into a bad habit. He's never been in an accident, but he's watching all these YouTube videos of terrible accidents, the dash cameras of people just smashing into semi-trucks, terrible accidents. So he's got all this garbage going to his brain. So what I'm trying to tell him is stop it. Stop watching these videos. <laughs> you need to put good things in your brain. 
if all day long you pour bad things in your brain, like for example, most of the news in the newspaper, you don't need to know. You don't need to know this house burned down, this car crashed, this boat sank, this plane crashed. You don't need to know that stuff. Should you be generally aware of global events? Yeah, you should be generally aware, but <laughs> most of the time, most of the stuff in the newspaper is this house burned down, this car crash. You don't need to know most of that stuff. It just brings you down. Instead, how about you put good things in your brain? Read uplifting literature, watch uplifting videos, pour good into your brain to offset the negative. All right, folks, we're reaching the end of our time together today. You have been awesome. I'll give you a quick plug here that Access Employment has partnered with Inkblot to offer all employees access to five hours of employer-sponsored mental health counseling, as well as five hours of health, life, and career coaching, okay? So you've had access to this wonderful uh, resource. Somebody's wrote, I've been much happier since I stopped following the news. Yeah, stop following the news. Anything I need to know will uh, get to me by word of mouth anyway. Yeah, if it's really bad, your family will tell you that stuff, okay? <laughs> so you've got, uh, uh, you can see the Inkblot we uh, website there. <laughs> Excuse me, inkblottherapy.com backslash access. And folks, if you have any questions, throw them into the text chat now. But it has just been wonderful serving you today. You've been a wonderful group. I've really enjoyed being with you. I hope that you have enjoyed this as well. You've gotten value. Thank you again, Jeanette, for setting this all up. And I hope you all have a wonderful, wonderful day. Thank you so much.